Holotropic breathwork is a new therapeutic technique that enables psychotherapists to induce non-ordinary states of consciousness. These mental states are similar to those observed in deep meditation, rituals of various cultures, and other forms of spiritual practice, as well as sessions with some psychedelic substances. Non-ordinary states of consciousness have been found to be extraordinarily effective in helping people gain insights into the sources of their emotional problems and to facilitate rapid healing. Holotropic breathwork was developed by Christina and Stanislav Groff. Dr. Groff is a clinical psychiatrist and the leading authority in the world on the healing potential of non-ordinary states of consciousness. As director of research at Maryland Psychiatric Research Center, Dr. Groff conducted extensive studies on the use of LSD and other psychedelic substances in the treatment of emotional disorders. He has written a number of books, including The Adventure of Self-Discovery and The Holotropic Mind. Together, he and his wife, Christina, wrote Beyond Death and The Stormy Search for the Self. Christina Groff is the author of The Thirst for Wholeness, Attachment, Addiction, and the Spiritual Path. She is the founder of the Spiritual Emergence Network and president of Groff Transpersonal Training. Stan and Christina Groff have spent nearly 20 years developing a simple but effective way for therapists to induce non-ordinary states of consciousness without using drugs. Many consider this to be a significant breakthrough in psychotherapy. This technique is called holotropic breathwork. My name is Walter Mead. I was intrigued by this new technology, so I arranged to talk with Stan and Christina Groff in California where they were conducting a training program for therapists. You and Christina have developed a powerful therapeutic approach called holotropic breathwork. You've put thousands of people through this workshop and you've trained hundreds of therapists to do this new practice. Can you tell me exactly what is holotropic breathwork? Uh, holotropic breathwork is an experiential approach to self-exploration, to therapy which uses very, very simple means. It, it uses uh, faster breathing, it uses uh, powerful evocative uh, music, uh, and also a certain kind of body work when it's indicated. And we also combine it with what we call mandala drawings, where people um, get a piece of uh, paper with a circle, and after the session they try to communicate um, what happened to them in a kind of graphic uh, way. And then these sessions are followed by, by sharing, where people uh, talk about their, uh, their experiences. Uh, in terms of the term holotropic, which sometimes puzzles people, it's not a common word. It's actually uh, our own word. Um, this, is a, this is a Greek word, which has two uh, parts to it. Uh, the part holo uh, is from holos, which means whole and uh, tropic from trepane, which means uh, oriented towards something or moving towards something, like in the term heliotropic, the plant when put to the window tends to follow the sun, so it's heliotropic. Uh, so literally this holotropic means moving towards wholeness, moving towards uh, the totality. Could you walk us through a typical holotropic breathwork session what would it look like from beginning to end? Well, first of all, we try to find a room that's large enough to hold a, a, a group of maybe 20, 30, up to maybe 40 people. Um, in a natural setting is the best, but it doesn't have to be that way. Uh, and then we ask the group to get together and choose partners. Each individual will choose a partner and in, the, in this first session, the, one of those people does the breathing and the other uh, person um, sits with him or her or attends uh, the breather. And so everybody has a personal attendant. Uh, and then they switch roles so that uh, everybody gets a chance to participate both as a breather and as a, what we call a sitter. And then we prepare the group theoretically. Stan will give a talk on um, some of the experiences people can have, a very wide 
understanding of the human uh, experience, the human psyche. Um, and we find that that helps in uh, people allowing themselves to go into parts of themselves that might, they might not otherwise uh, easily move into. Uh, and then in the session itself, uh, we ask people to lie down on the floor. The, the breathers lie down on the floor. The partner or sitter sits with them. And then I will do a relaxation to help uh, people to, to kind of get into a, an open, relaxed state of mind and body uh, so that they can most more easily have their experience. Um, and after the relaxation, we'll ask them to start doing some breathing, which is faster uh, and deeper than their usual breathing pattern. Um, encourage them to find their own rhythm throughout the session, which is still deeper and faster than usual. And then we'll put on some music. Uh, the music will support that experience um, as they're having it. The session usually lasts an hour and a half to two to two and a half hours. Um, and then uh, after the session, we encourage people to draw uh, something that will express what that experience was for them. And then we'll talk about it in the, in the small groups um, afterwards. The breathing seems to be a key aspect of this new therapeutic approach. What is so important about the breathing? The breathing has been used throughout centuries in many, many different cultures as one of the most powerful means to change consciousness you know, in many, many different ways. You can do all kinds of things uh, with your breathing to change your consciousness. So some of those uh, ways are very extreme. For example, the original baptism as it was practiced by the Essenes involved actually um, four or five people taking the initiate to the river and holding the head under water until they came close to death and then surfacing them. Uh, you can change your consciousness by breathing faster. You can change your consciousness by withholding breath or, or alternating those two. And there are also very refined, very subtle ways of uh, changing consciousness with breathing, uh, where there is um, no change in the actual uh, rate of breathing, but there is a certain quality of attention to the breathing, like in the Eastern spiritual traditions, in Zen, for example, uh, you just pay very, very exquisite attention to your exhalation or to your inhalation. They're also in many of the Aboriginal traditions, either breathing or uh, certain vocal performances that change breathing are used to alter consciousness. The, the Eskimo, Inuit, throat music, um, the, the Kachuk, uh, the monkey chant in Bali and so on. Uh, so we have experimented in our month-long workshops with many, many different ways of uh, changing consciousness by breathing. And we have then found out that it's basically very simple, that all you have to do is to ask people to breathe a little faster, a little deeper, with this uh, quality of attention, where you shift uh, attention from your head, from the cognitive process, to your body, to your breathing. And uh, after a while, that profoundly changes consciousness. Also, we ask people to do this process with their eyes closed. That This is an inner journey, this is an inner experience. And so for the time of the session, which may last for you know, a, a couple of hours, they keep the, the inner world separate from the external world so that they get a, a rich experience of what, of what comes up for them. The music appears to be a very critical part of your whole approach to holotropic breathwork. Could you tell me a little bit about how you select the music? Okay, well, this is one of my favorite parts of the holotropic breathwork. Um, uh, I think the, the music adds a very rich, a very aesthetic uh, dimension uh, to the work. Um, and it, it gives people a kind of carrying frequency with which they can have their experience. Um, it also, because there is this kind of aesthetic sound in the room, it allows people to uh, maybe emote or express themselves more easily than if the room uh, were silent. When I choose the music, I look, uh, first of all, for pieces that are not too easily recognizable. 
if we use music with words, we use music with words from another culture, from another language. Um, we like to use a combination of all different kinds of music. There's some classical pieces that are not too well known or um, some ethnic music that particularly that that has been developed partic particularly for uh, inducing non-ordinary states of consciousness so from many different uh, ethnic uh, cultural uh, roots uh, a lot of drumming a lot of chanting and so on some very um, spiritual music from different cultures um, the best of some electronic music, and I would say the best of electronic music, because some electronic music can be very invasive if somebody's wide open uh, experientially or emotionally. One of the, the basic uh, attributes of this work is that we very much believe that each person contains his or her own answers. You know, that there's a deep healing wisdom that comes out of each person. So I, as the music maker, would not ever want to impose what I think that person needs to hear in order to get to a certain experience. But uh, instead, I would want to create an atmosphere that is conducive to whatever experience the person needs to have or the group, or people in the group need to have. Um, so I, what I do is to watch what is going on in the room and to then put on music to support that. So for example, I'll, I'll usually start with some kind of activating music, something with some rhythm that will help people get into the breathing. But then if um, the beginning part of the session is very dramatic, there's a kind of emotional build up, um, people are beginning to get in touch with some old unfinished business from their past, uh, I will put on some emotional dramatic music to, to support that. Um, then if uh, that becomes more and more intense, more dramatic, there's some physical movement going on, I'll put on music to support that. Um, often in the session there will be a number of people who will get to a point of some kind of emotional breakthrough or uh, some very positive, uh, sometimes spiritual kinds of experiences. I will put on some uplifting music um, that will support that. Sometimes you can see people crying in, in the, the sort of the tears of recognition in a way. And I'll put on some choral music or some s music that to support that. And then gradually the session will get quieter and quieter and quieter. And uh, at that point I'll put on a more meditative music, quieter music. Um, Basically, the session will often follow that curve where it gets more and more intense and there's a kind of a breakthrough time and then it becomes quieter. But that sequence uh, changes according to, what the, according to the group. And so I always want to stay very um, conscious of what it is going on in the room and, and just follow that. You also mentioned that you do body work with people in the holotropic breathwork sessions. Why would you do the body work and how do you do it? I should say something first about the, the effect of the, the breathing on the body in, in general. Uh, what we see is uh, in many instances a development of tensions in different uh, parts of the body. Uh, in the medical literature you find the concept of the so-called hyperventilation syndrome. The idea is if people breathe faster, they develop uh, spasms in the hands and in the feet. This is called carpopedal spasms in the medical literature. And then also get agitated and a lot of powerful emotions uh, come up. And there's a tendency to see it as a kind of a undesirable thing in, in medicine. And uh, various ways are recommended how you can stop it. Some people start breathing actually spontaneously. Uh, about 10 to 15 percent of the population sometimes start doing this uh, spontaneously. Uh, now, we have now uh, done the work with probably 25,000 people or, or seen 25,000 sessions, and we see that this is simply a myth in the medical literature. Uh, many people uh, who breathe will actually go directly into a very profoundly relaxed state. The more they breathe, they they, the more relaxed they feel, um, 
they start seeing light, they feel connected to other people, to nature, and they have just a beautiful experience. But most people will develop some form of tension in their body, but it doesn't have to be in the hands, in the feet, it could be anywhere in the body. And the way we understand it now is that the breathing creates a condition in the organism that certain old uh, tensions that are associated with traumatic situations, biographical uh, birth experience and so on, or even something coming from, from uh, what we now call transpersonal levels, uh, these, these deep tensions start surfacing and they manifest. And actually by experiencing them, uh, people are getting rid of them. Uh, so in some sessions we don't have to do any body work, but there are some other sessions in which when the breathing uh, ends, they still have tensions in certain parts of their body, and that's where the body work uh, comes in. And the, basic, the basic strategy here is that we check the body of the person, see where the symptoms are, then we ask them to actually do something to accentuate the symptom. We always want to extract the symptoms. We want more of what's happening. And then we do something from the outside to accentuate it even further. And while we are holding the tension in that part of the body, we ask the person to allow the rest of the body to express anything that wants to happen without any censorship. And this could be something that doesn't make any sense not only screaming, but baby talk, uh, gibberish. Sometimes people start talking in tongues, uh, in a foreign language that they have never uh, learned. Uh, animal sounds can come up. There could be very, very um, broad spectrum of vocal responses. There could be shaking in all kinds of parts of, of the body, coughing, gagging that comes up. Again, as part of clearing, as part of uh, uh, kind of purification. Uh, of the tensions related to old uh, traumatic situations. You said that at the end of the breathwork session, people go and draw mandalas. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Well, first of all, we take the term mandala from various meditative uh, approaches. Uh, I think the actual word mandala, mandala means circle. Uh, and in these meditative approaches, they use a certain geometric shape in order to help to focus their attention in meditation. So we've kind of broadly used that concept. Um, what it is is that we will, after a session, we will have paper and drawing materials available to people and we will draw with a light pencil a circle shape on the paper and then ask people to sit with the drawing materials in the paper after their session in a kind of meditative frame of mind, in a kind of introspective frame of mind, and from that place draw something that will um, express what went on in the session. It can be shapes, it can be just colors, it can be um, a figurative designs. It, some people will do some sort of code that will help them to remember the different steps in the, in the process. Um, they can either contain it within the circle or they can completely ignore the circle. Some people don't want to deal with the circle at all and they will turn the paper over and do their own, their own thing. We've also sometimes used clay, we've used uh, painting. Um, so what we, what we like to do is to use this as a tool for people to help to understand themselves, to understand their experience, and maybe by externalizing um, it in this way, they will gain insight from what appears on the paper. This is not a cognitive process in any way, but instead we encourage people, no matter who they are, no matter whether they think they're artistic or not, to just uh, draw or paint from the inside out and see what comes out. And then we will encourage people to put the mandala, hang it somewhere where they can see it, at home maybe, whether they like it, whether they don't like it, and um, see what kinds of insights might come at a later time. But sometimes we can see that what will come out in the mandala after a session will uh, will sometimes be uh, 
will predict what images, what experiences might come up later in dreams or in therapy or in other uh, breathwork sessions. So they can be very instructive. And then if people in our training uh, or doing ongoing breathwork sessions will keep their mandalas and then refer to them as little signposts of their, of their ongoing uh, process. And then uh, we encourage people to take their mandalas or their drawings or paintings uh, into the group. We have a, a, a session after the, the experience, after the mandala drawing, where people have the opportunity to talk about their experience in the whole group. Um, some people feel that they need to and want to talk about their experience. Others feel that they're still a little close to it and they, they'd rather kind of keep it to themselves for a while, and that's fine. Um, but those who talk about it, it um, helps them again to gain more understanding about what went on, to get the reaction of the people in the group um, that will fur and maybe add some uh, further pieces um, for them and it helps them to integrate the experience a little bit by, by somehow uh, verbalizing it and bringing it to, to other people. So far we've talked about preparing people for breath work, we've talked about the breathing, we've talked about the music, we've talked about the body work and the drawing the mandalas, but this is essentially an inner experience. What kinds of inner experiences could people expect to have in a holotropic breathwork session? And there's a fascinating aspect of this work, uh, the holotropic breathwork and uh, the work with non-ordinary states in general, which is that they function as something like a radar, which means the, the state somehow finds the, the areas in the unconscious which are most relevant in the sense that they have the strongest emotional charge. And that will be the part somehow that surfaces into consciousness. And uh, the, the actual content uh, could um, cover a very wide spectrum. Uh, so some people, for example, uh, will confront some important material from their infancy, from childhood, even from later life, something that has a strong emotional significance for them. And this, this would be what emerges somehow for them to look at, to, to work through, to assimilate. Uh, for other people, it could be uh, something related to biological birth, which is a, which is a tremendous source of difficult emotions, physical uh, manifestations of various kinds. We see people reliving actually birth with a lot of details, uh, being able to find out uh, different aspects of, uh, of their birth, uh, the position in which they were born, uh, the kind of anesthesia which was used, uh, uh, the fact that there was an umbilical cord around the neck, the fact uh, there was forceps involved, and so on. Another very, very significant category of experiences are experiences that we call transpersonal, which take people into um, mystical realms, into spiritual realms, into what Carl Gustav Jung would call the collective unconscious, either the historical or, or the archetypal, the mythological aspect of the collective unconscious. So people suddenly would have experiences in other centuries, in other countries, sometimes with a sense of personal remembering that they talk about past life experiences. Or in the mythological realm, encountering deities like uh, Shiva, Kali, uh, Jesus, uh, Mary, uh, Wotan, and so on. Or experiencing some uh, realms, archetypal realms, like uh, paradise, uh, heaven. Uh, another possibility is people identifying with animals or connecting with some other aspects of nature. People experiencing cosmic consciousness, a sense of unity with the universal mind, uh, experience of the cosmic void. Many, many experiences that we read about in the great spiritual scriptures of the world. So the spectrum is extremely rich. Uh, for some people, and this has something to do with the radar function, there might not be very rich uh, specific content in terms of visions. If it's a person who has a lot of um, physical tension in the body, the whole session might be just a tremendous build-up of physical tension and then deep relief. Or for somebody who uh, is very angry, for whom anger is the most important problem at the time, can experience a tremendous uh, upsurge of rage 
and then uh, can express that range with help of others and feels uh, much more peaceful. It sounds like this would be a very exciting experience, perhaps an enjoyable one, but what's the value? Why would anyone do it? It's a very important question. Uh, you see, what we see is that in uh, contrast with traditional psychology, psychiatry, where the sources of problems are all in infancy, in childhood, or in later life, we see that actually if we have emotional problems, psychosomatic problems, or some problems with, in relation with other people, that the roots are not just in our biography, but they are also additional roots uh, uh, connected to uh, the trauma of birth. And the roots of these problems can even go to what we call the transpersonal level. So that uh, in order to really work through a problem in a, in a reasonably short time, people have to allow themselves to have experiences in all those categories. So you can be working on asthma or on a phobia, for example, and you will find something meaningful related to it that comes from your childhood or infancy. And then as the process deepens and continues, you find out that the same problem also has a deeper root in connection to a certain facet of your birth experience. And then, uh, as you continue, you might find out, uh, out that there is a connection to what you perceive as a past life experience, or there's a connection to what Jung would call an archetype, or that um, to work through your anger, you might have to experience part of it in identification with a panther or a wolf. So these are very, very therapeutic, very transforming, healing uh, experiences. You know, my background is as a clinical psychiatrist, so I'm, uh, this is where I came from, and I'm very, very interested in this healing potential. It goes beyond just the adventure of self-discovery. So, why couldn't I simply go home, put on an eye shade, or close my eyes, put on loud music, breathe deeply, and have very fascinating experiences? This uh, approach is deceptively simple. I mean, as you say, we do breathing, we ask people, you know, lie down, we play music and, and have an experience and then draw. Uh, but it's not all that simple. Well, for one thing, we have great respect for the wisdom at the healing wisdom that each person has. Uh, and at the same time that that experience, that the, the wisdom that will bring forward these kinds of uh, uh, experiences, whatever the person needs to look at in order to, to, to uh, uh, become clearer, more whole people, that that needs to be supported by other people that there needs to be a safe context in which these kinds of experiences, some of them very vulnerable, some of them quite difficult, can uh, come forward. Um, and we believe very strongly that the people around someone having a holotropic breathwork experience need to be trained. They need to understand how to support someone through various kinds of experiences that stand uh, was describing. They need to know how to, how to create a safe and supportive environment so that the person can go as fully as possible wherever their, uh, their experience or their psyche uh, takes them. Um, and that, as with many things, uh, you know, approaches that seem to be deceptively simple have some uh, intricate background uh, behind them. Uh, there's also the question of learning how to trust uh, these experiences that, that um, some people will, f if you go home and do it, try to do it on your own, you f might find yourself entering some experience that you are afraid of or that you don't trust fully and that's where it's helpful to have someone around who knows the experience, who knows how to support it, who can say, go ahead into it, we're here to, to keep you safe. We're here to go with you wherever you need to go. Uh, there is an additional reason. People have to do a lot of uh, inner work to be able to be there kind of uh, unperturbed, you know, supporting a very, very intense emotional process of another person. We see that people, before they get really full training, they tend to get actually triggered by the exper powerful experience of another person. And instead of being there as a, as a support, they end up in process themselves. So 
we conduct training, which uh, lasts a minimum of uh, two years, uh, where uh, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers, and also a number of uh, students who want to learn this, uh, undergo very systematic training, which involves information as well as powerful experiential work, where they alternate in the role of experiencers and sitters, and then also later starts doing what we call floating, which is working with the whole group, as they are preparing for uh, doing it on their own, uh, conducting uh, workshops. We ask people to have at least five experiences in a workshop uh, context before they apply for this training to be sure that that's something they want to commit to. And then we arrange the training in the form of what we call modules, six-day uh, workshops which combine a specific kind of information. Each, each module has a different uh, topic. Um, some of them are mandatory, some of them are uh, facultative, uh, optional and people have to have seven of these modules and then when they complete this training then we have a two-week uh, certification. Okay, well one of the things that we see is that there are people who have uh, had practices as therapists of one kind or another or as clergy or so on and um, they begin to see experiences in their clients that don't fit the kind of the tr more traditional models of what human experience is about, uh, that it's not just about biography, that there's something else happening there, uh, and they become attracted to an expanded understanding of uh, and the transpersonal per perspective of the human um, experience, or they will have ha had their own experiences along the way, and they, they say, you know, uh, I've want, I, or I've been doing work that with this kind of orientation for a long time. It's been behind closed doors. I don't talk to my colleagues about what I really believe. And now here is a psychology that will address um, some of what I've been seeing for years, some of what I've been working with for years, but I just couldn't uh, talk about it in, in uh, some of the professional circles in which I'm operating. What kind of results do you see from this kind of experience? Well, I mentioned I'm a, you know, originally a clinical psychiatrist, so uh, I'm particularly interested in the changes that happen in terms of what we would consider clinical symptoms. We see people uh, moving out of depression, for example. We see people clearing a lot of psychosomatic uh, symptoms, uh, migraine headache, asthma, uh, pains, tensions in different uh, uh, parts of the body. Uh, we have seen people uh, getting over different forms of uh, phobias and variety of other problems, improving self-image, feeling more, more assertive, uh, and so on, uh, removing guilt, for example. I was invited to videotape an actual holotropic breathwork session. The participants included about 50 therapists who were attending the training program to become certified as facilitators of holotropic breathwork. The session began with the breathers lying down on mats on the floor with their partners sitting nearby. Many of the breathers wore eye shades to block out the light. Others just closed their eyes. When everyone was settled in and ready to start, Christina led the group in deep relaxation exercises. When the breathers were completely relaxed, she asked them to breathe deeper and faster than usual. After a few moments of deep breathing, she started the music. It was quite loud, mysterious, and involved provocative, primitive rhythms. For the first 15 minutes or so, the group seemed quite subdued, and I worried that the presence of the camera crew might inhibit the participants. As it turned out, I was wrong. Many participants started screaming, crying, and moaning while writhing around on their mats. They were obviously having what appeared to be powerful emotional experiences.
Later in the session, the sitters and other facilitators did body work on some of the participants. The body work is to intensify the symptoms, such as back pain or headache, in order to release and surface repressed memories that might be associated with the physical tensions. After about two and a half hours, the room became quieter and the session seemed to be winding down. Many of the breathers seemed emotionally drained. Some of the breathers spoke quietly with their sitters. Others embraced or just shared a quiet moment together. Participants gradually left to go to another room where they drew mandalas relating to their inner experiences. That evening, some of the participants shared their experiences with the group. For the past few sessions, I have been struggling in the birth canal and have had the feeling I was doing it over and over and over again. And uh, today, while well, there are a lot of body movements and still the feeling of stuckness and not being able to get out of there. Um, feeling alone and, and getting to the place where I felt I didn't have what it took to get free or to get out. Or